here momentarily. Well, and we are live. So I will give it a moment here and we will see who pops on. Usually everybody will kind of start to pop on like 10 minutes before. So but I didn't do the whole fancy shindig tonight with the music and all that stuff. So we'll see who pops on here momentarily. Chat. Okay, I got my chat pulled up. So, well, we'll patiently wait here and see who pops on. Thank you, Facebook. Hmm. Ah, somebody's on there. I got two people hopping on here. If you guys want to comment so I know who's on here. And I'm going to send Trent the link because he must be having difficulties. Because I know, hey, Paul, how are you? Like, long time no see. I saw you this morning. So, tonight should be, I'm super excited for tonight. It has been a while. And hey, Peggy, I figured you would be here as always. Let me, come on. Sorry, I'm doing three things at once, Paul and Peggy. That's a very bad thing. I'm going to send a link over to Trent. We will see. It says waiting on me, but that's really weird. I don't know. Technology, man, right? At least we're not having audio issues. Knock on wood. I don't know who else we have on. So anybody else out there besides Peggy and Paul? I know there's always somebody hovering out into the world, so. But. Once Trent hops on here, hopefully, I will get started. Well, I'm glad you were on, Peggy. Oh, you couldn't come up to Coffee and Clicks today. That's what that was. I was like I said, I got my wires all crisscrossed today. And I know, Paul, you're still thinking about that Z8. I just know it, as always, right? <laughs> Collecting pop cans on the way home, right? You get that four grand saved up. Oh. Hopefully. Ah, Trent said, hold on. So maybe things are working. So tonight I've got Dennis on as with Kent and then Trent. I think some of you guys know Trent. And then, well, let's see. Ah, one second. I'm going to email Trent real quick. There we are. Plus, all this gives us time for other people to pop on. I know some of my other regulars won't be on this evening. So, because they are out of town. So, I will get back. So, hopefully, like I said, Trent, Trent will pop in. But I got dentists and dentists. Gee, many Christmases. Dennis and Kent. So, um, I don't know if anybody, I, know, I would assume nobody knows Kent. That's okay. So, he's an awesome guy. You will meet him here momentarily. Dennis is one of my former students from Paul's Photo and the Creative Photo Academy. And then, as always, um, Trent, if you don't know Trent, he's a commercial and landscape fine art guy. So, And then uh, Kent does some journalistic work, or did, and does a lot of cool stuff. Hey, Connie, and everybody's got photos to send through tonight, so we'll get to see their work as well. So, so we are just waiting on Trent, because for some weird reason, as we all know with late night exposures, guess what? We have some technical difficulty at every corner every other month so last month we skimmed by with no issues so why wouldn't we have one this month so how are you connie i was hoping to see you at uh camera and clicks or coffee and clicks they keep calling it camera and clicks coffee and clicks this morning but i figured you were busy so 
Let's see here. Ah, this corresponding with trend. So has anybody taken any pictures this weekend or this week or I don't know? I'm just still editing photos back from Nebraska and North Dakota and South Dakota. So I, uh, there's two photos I really loved, but I just wasn't in the mood, I guess, to edit them. I could make the vision come true. So uh, last minute hiccups, Connie, it happens. So got to love that, right? So yes, as we all know, there's times that uh, you're going to edit a photo or two and you just can't make it happen. So I was not in the right headspace for those two edits. So, but they sure got them. So I'll post, I got some stuff posted, I think Monday, Wednesday, and Friday this week from the trip. And then I got more I'll post next week. So I know everybody's always looking at my shenanigans wherever I'm traveling to. So, and then in two weeks, well, I'll go through at the end, but in a couple of weeks, the, um, I'll have two weeks in a row we won't do a show just because I'm then traveling over to Mesa Verde and um, Great Sand Dunes in Colorado for a week. So, but we will see here momentarily. Hopefully, we'll get rolling here momentarily. Anybody else doing anything like super exciting photographically or not, I guess? Ah, you got a bucket list photo. There you go, Connie. Or sorry, Connie. Peggy, I am a hot mess this evening, right? That happens about every three shows, right? To all the regulars. <laughs> so, oh. I was going to say, I, I, would, I could almost say I, my bucket list is checked off again. I got another Theodore Roosevelt National Park when I was in North Dakota. That was a four-hour side trip that I didn't plan. Um Oh, Dennis just private messaged me. I should consider a trip to Coral Pink Sand Dunes in Southern Utah. <laughs> so, uh, I got a lot of things. Everybody said there's lots of sand in my future this year since I got back from White Sands in February. So, but uh, let's see here. What was that? That was a weird little blurb that I've never heard of before. Huh. Oh, there's Trent. So I have Trent on. So awesome. Okay. So Trent is up first, but let's, I'm going to pop up. You should hopefully see the a personal perspective on photography. So super exciting. So we've got Trent will be up first and then I've got uh, Kent second and then we have Dennis third. So everybody probably knows Trent a little bit. Um, Kent is, used to work at the Omaha World Herald. I think I met Kent like way back in 2003 briefly. And then we've probably connected through Facebook for a while and Instagram. And that's, that's where it hits. And then Dennis was one of my uh, former students through Paul's photo in the creative photo Academy. So, so tonight it's kind of just like that personal perspective on photography. I mean, since August, you guys have heard me blab away for hours on end about all my opinions and how I see things and technological things. And I thought, you know what, why not have other people besides me? Because some people say, Oh, I want to listen to you. No, no one wants to listen to me always. So I think the more you can listen to other people, see different sides, you can be inspired in different ways. And we have a very wide range of work this evening, it will see. So that's that was uh, going to be super cool to see. So the first thing is, let me scroll over here, is that one of the questions we're going to answer or they're going to answer tonight is kind of like, what is photography to them, right? So why not know the right? The general definition of photography, right? And it says the art and practice or the art or practice of taking and processing a photograph. That sounds horrible because we all know it's so much more than that. It's creativity, it's personal perspective, it's line, it's shapes, it's forms, it's color, it's everything, right? That is just does not put it in two words what it should be. Um, you know, because we've all heard it. Oh, your camera takes such beautiful photos. Oh, hell no. We all know it's not that. It's the 12 inches behind me. They don't know that, right? They're not photographers, you know, or we've heard, um, oh, you just click a button. Why do you charge me so much? It's, as we know, it's so much more than clicking a shutter button, right? So, well, we will get started here with our first one, and that is going to be Trent. So I'm going to pop Trent up here on the screen. And there he is. How are you? Evening, sir? Look at that light. That light. Mm. Oh, my light? No, my light. No, my light. I'm at you. Oh, you're kind of crackly, too. I don't know if it's... Well, I had to switch over to my left. I my left back to my back. 
studio, and I don't need it, and I don't write, I don't know why I can't email on my laptop, I have to get your link, so I kind of have to kind of act this super fast, super fast, you know, you're not, you know, you're not. Yeah, it's like super static, that's weird, huh? Um, um, I don't have an answer to that answer, you can email on my laptop, my laptop, link you sent, link you sent, like last week, last week, is the link, is the link that you're saying, waiting on host. Ah, you know what? I'm going to try something here on my end. Yeah, hold on. If I can get into my laptop, it was working. It was working. Everything was perfect until it kept saying, kept saying, waiting on host, on host all of a sudden. Now, go. Now, say again, say again. It might have fixed it. Might have fixed the problem. Hold on. I don't know what it's doing, to be honest. Can you hear me? Can you hear me at all? I can't hear you. I can't hear you. Can hear you, but you're super Yeah, I don't. I don't it, this has to be my system, and I can't get in. I, I don't know. Oh, there you are. There you are. You're good. You can hear me. You're good. You can hear me now? Yeah, there you are. Yeah, we are. We are. Hmm. So maybe it's not me ish. The light is. Look at that. I'm really not that pale. Sorry about the light. I guess it is what it is. I can't hear you, though. Yeah, because I shut myself off. Yeah, so. I shut myself off. So. Uh oh. Is that better? Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. So hmm. the first thing here. The first thing here. Again, I apologize for that bad light. Holy crap. That's ah, okay, right? We all gotta have it. So tell us your story, Trent. How did this whole thing start for you? This photographer for you. This Um well, I've been shooting professionally 31 years as a commercial guy. Um, you know, the people that are on here that know me know the story. Um, I graduated Southern Illinois in Carbondale with a bachelor's of arts in photography and a bachelor's of science and forestry. Um, started out working with the national park service, then the national forest service as a photographer, backcountry ranger, um, really didn't. You know, the, the program I went through in Carbondale was for commercial advertising photography. It was all 4 by 5 8 by 10 film, lighting. Um, and that's really what, what the, that program was for. So, But when I graduated, I had no desire to even become a photographer. I, I just, I, I really enjoyed it. I loved photography. I love large format photography, but I loved being outside more. Um so when I was working for the Forest Service, I was on my way back from Colorado. I had a job in New Hampshire, and I stopped in St. Louis. Um, and some of the guys that I went to photo school with were working with big photographers in St. Louis. And back then, in the early 90s, St. Louis was a hotbed of advertising photography. I mean, it was it was as good as New York and Chicago, L.A., um, I stopped and saw one of my best friends there. And like I said, he was working in a studio. He said for a hundred bucks a day, you can be working here. And believe it or not, that was more than I was making for the forest service. <laughs> so I, uh, I said, all right. Um, started with working with some of the biggest photographers there. We were doing, uh, you name it. I mean, anything Anheuser-Busch, everything for Ralston, um, old El Paso foods. I mean, it was just, a plethora of stuff that I was able to to get into these different studios and I went full time at a studio and it was probably three years later three or four years later I had a 8,000 square foot studio downtown St. Louis and I was on my own I was doing then I was doing Anheuser-Busch Miller Volvo St. Louis Zoo Cracker Barrel um, so I've got longevity in the business and I really wasn't shooting a lot of personal work. I mean, I would come back up to Geneseo, which is where I'm at now, 
and I would photograph a little bit of the, of the rural landscapes, what was going on. But I had, again, no desire to do that because I loved photography all of a sudden and being able to give clients what they were asking for. You know, they would show up with a layout and we would spend all day shooting four by five film, you know, to get two shots. Um, and it was really hard. It was painstakingly hard. Uh, there was no Photoshop. It was all Polaroid. It was push pulling film. Um, and the washout rate of professional photographers was a lot, you know, everybody, everybody, everybody has some creativity in them. Um, but you really needed to on the job, you couldn't come unglued. You had to be able to solve problems. You know, if you flew, if they packed you up and flew five or six of you somewhere and you had three hours to get an image of Dan Moreno for a POP, a cutout, you know, um, for upper deck trading cards, you better get it. There's no, there's no putting the images together. There's no nothing. And if you've got five hours on set, you've probably got 10 or 15 with that person. And so that's really where I thrive. Even today, I believe um, I love that about photography. I love the unexpected. I, I don't get rattled anymore. There's there's nothing that I haven't seen done. You know, I used to photograph with House of Blood cameras. I shot almost a whole job, but and there was no film in the backs because my assistant didn't load them. I didn't check. So then you got to start over. You know, you just got to make up an excuse and and hopefully it, you know things are fine. Um, so that was really the, the draw to advertising photography. I mean, even today, even like, again, last month was 31 years. Um, and about 10 or 15 years ago, I started photographing the landscape back up here and that kind of got me in, you know, and, and to be honest, I wasn't doing anything earth shattering, but there were a lot of guys, there were no guys doing what I was doing here. They weren't photographing the barns. They weren't doing it black and white. Everything was still mountains, streams, and oceans. And um, and not that I was changing the world. That's not what I was doing. I was photographing the barns that my grandpa owned. Um, and then it got back to a client. And then um, it kind of snowballed. And then I started doing gallery work with it. And got in with the nation's biggest publisher, Bruce McGall Graphics. Um, but again, I, I just wasn't doing anything other than what I wanted to do. And I wasn't looking at it to make money at it. It was just something that first it became more documenting what was going on with the farms going away and the fields going, you know, getting bigger and fence rows going away. And somehow that translated with my advertising clients because I picked up a lot of architecture work all of a sudden, a lot of construction work, a lot of um, more work along those lines. And it was a very strange transition for me um, because up until that time, I only photographed people, mostly people, animals and products. You know, it, it wasn't buildings. It wasn't, you know, now I do a lot of construction workers. And, and the problem where I am now, you know, work wise is my work is a product of where I am um, and what's available. I don't market in Chicago anymore. Um, and, you know, let's say when I was in St. Louis, if there were, I'm, I'm taking a stab here. If there were 18 or 19 really great studio shooter advertising guys, there's probably 300 down there now that consider themselves photographers. And I struggle with that um, because Photoshop has changed everything. Digital has changed everything. Art directors are younger. Expectations are nothing. They're so low. Um, and so I struggle with the quality of work that's getting done, uh, in the advertising world right now. So I kind of went off on a soapbox there. I apologize. That's what I do it all the time. That's what I do it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll hit our next slide here. So we'll hit our next slide here. So what's your definition of so photography? What's your definition of photography? Well, you know, photography, when, when I teach classes, and again, people that know me, I, I say the same thing over and over and over. I mean, photography, to me, is photographing the light on the subject. You know, a, a subject is there. A barn is there. A tree is there. A shoe on a white sweep is there. I can turn the shoe, 
I can turn the light, but it's really about the light hitting the subject um, and trying to evoke emotion. And, you know, my goal, which I don't know if I'm able to do it anymore, is to try to give the viewer something they've never seen. Um, and I don't know if I can. I don't know if that's possible like I like to think it is. Um, Photoshop has changed photography. And I love digital. I'll never go back to film. I mean, I have my 4 by 5 camera set up because I love it, but I'll never photograph with it again, ever. Um, I love to print black and white, but I love digital black and white. But there's a lot of great people out there now, you know, because they're showing us things that we've never seen. And, you know, they're, but now it's getting redundant to me. And so photography has its lulls. It goes up and down where I get super excited about something personally. And I don't get a lot of response from a client or if I post it, which really shouldn't mean anything. But we all get a little hurt if, you know, you're like super excited and you get like, you know, however many likes you're like, oh, that's some bullshit. Then, you know, all of a sudden you post something that you're really not into and you show your clients and they think it's the best thing ever. So, you know, it's very strange because everybody has their own way of looking at images. You know, photography is also about interpretation and experiences. You know, um, I've seen the ocean. I've seen palm trees. There's probably not a photo out there that can get me excited. It just, they're nice, but I, you know, I don't care. It, it doesn't mean anything to me. Um, just so photography is just this thing that you try to capture moments, you know, and, and to be honest, I don't carry my camera around like I used to, because I found that I was losing out on too many moments by having the camera up to my face. So I was talking to somebody last night and they invited me to go see the Northern lights. I'm like, yeah, you know, he said, and we can, you know, photograph I'm like, no, I just want to stand there. You know, I've, I, I've seen a lot of great pictures of the Northern Lights, and I don't need to add another one to it. I want to experience it. So at some time, you know, sometimes in, in my career, photography isn't the foremost thing. Um, but looking back, you know, of all the images I've taken in 30 years, I could tell you who, what, where, when, how, probably what time of the day it was. I can't tell you when my kids' birthdays are, but I can tell you where that barn was, at what intersection, in what county. And it's very strange. It's it's a very weird thing for me. I am the same way. I am the same way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and, and, you know, my goal, again, with photography is just looking at something different. Just looking, looking at, at what's out there in front of us and trying to see it differently. And it's hard to so do. So, like... Like I oh, said, yeah. Oh, yeah. no, go ahead. Oh, so yeah, so uh, that kind of leads into the next question. Is the clear passion? How does photography role in your life and how it influenced you as a person? Um, early on, it was all too consuming because that's what it does. Um, I wanted to learn and learn and learn and learn and and. Not that I learned everything when it comes to shooting film in the studio, but I learned a lot. I mean, and I was pretty quick and good um, and I could make my clients really happy so they would come back. And then this Photoshop thing kind of snuck in and I started on Photoshop one, you know, and then we had to buy big dollar scanners to scan in a piece of film, you know, and, and it just... <clears throat> My learning curve all of a sudden became an upside down bell curve. I knew nothing about what was going on. And so, you know, however many years ago that was, um, I know Photoshop really well for what I need it to do. If somebody said, hey, can you? Mm, probably not, not real well, but I could figure it out. And I think that too many people approach Lightroom and Photoshop and photography trying to do everything and you don't need to do everything you need to do what you want to do you need to figure out you know it's because i could spend hours every evening or you know i'm fortunate enough where my studio is at my house and i do this full time for a living i don't spend all day in front of the computer learning photoshop 
If a client comes to me and says, hey, we need to do this, sometimes I can and sometimes I can't. And the reality of it is that there are guys that can do it so much better than me. Doesn't make any sense. I'd rather capture than Photoshop. So I've, I've made photography less of an obsession and more. And not that it's just a job because, I, I mean, I went out today and photographed some stuff. I mean, I still photograph a lot and I'm still working on projects and working on books and working on trying to get into places. Um, but it's not as consuming as it used to be. Exactly. Exactly. So now I'll have you talk about some of your work. Ha, I lied. So the last question is how do you find balance between that technical proficiency and work just proficiency and work just proficiency? Well, that's a tough one. I mean, that's really, really hard because the camera, and I don't care if, if you photograph with a $6 camera or a $6,000 camera, it's just a camera. I mean, granted, pro cameras do a little bit more. I mean, they're, they're made for certain things. Um, and, you know, I'm in the Canon world. I, I photograph with the R5s. I don't know what that camera is capable of doing unless I need it to do it. Unless a client asks me to do it or I push it and push it and push it. You know, I don't know. I, it, it's a great camera. It exposes well. It, it has great dynamic range. It shoots video fine. Um, but I watch some of these YouTube videos and I don't know how people know what this stuff, all these things do. I don't know. So technically, again, I know what I need to know. And then maybe one step above, just, just enough. You know, and if I've got a job coming up and I know what it is and and there's something that that sparks like, hmm, I wonder how that's going to work out. Then I start diving in either at the Photoshop end of it or the camera end of it. Um, and so, you know, be, because of the what I have to shoot, I am completely neur anally neurotic about color balance, you know, because architects want color balance. Architect. You know, and, and I'm insanely always calibrating my monitors. I'm always doing that stuff. And then you find out they're working on a $3 Dell monitor that doesn't matter what color it is. But I know my colors are good when I send it to them. You know, I'm, I'm press ready when it comes <coughs> from me to them. My blacks are black. My whites are white. They're not yellow. They're not beige if that's the way they're supposed to be. And so that's something that I work on all the time, all the time. Um, but then artistically, you have to understand enough of that equipment in front of you to get artistic. So it, I just kind of flipped on what I just said. You know, you, you have to be able to, to know how to push the camera. You have to know how to be able to push Photoshop because unfortunately, Photoshop and photography for me are one and the same. They really, they, they combine each other. And everything you see commercially advertising, high-end, fine art, it's all through Photoshop. I, I, I don't care. I will fight anybody that says I'm wrong because I'm not. You know, those black and whites could be 14 different exposures. They're layer masking. They're doing this. That is not coming out of the camera. But if you want your images to look like that, you got to be able to expose. And then you got to take it to the next level. So there's that fine line of, again, what do you want to do? So I study, again, again, people that know me, I don't study photography. I study painters because painters are magic with light. Just they get it. They know where light comes from. And photographers don't. You know, when they add when they add light in Photoshop and you've got the sun up here, but then you've got a shadow somewhere else, like, how did that work out? That's not how it works. So that stuff drives me crazy. So that, I think I answered that. I think you did. I think you did. So we'll look at your work here now. Look at your work here now. So if you just kind of, so I can you, just kind of go through these, but, but if you want to kind of just touch on things and um, people things and people. Yeah, I love totem poles. 
And I was trying to figure out how I could photograph photographically do totem poles. Um, I'm not that good in Photoshop. They weren't looking like I wanted them to look. And so I went to a zoo and photographed a bunch of animals. And I love, I mean, if, if people follow my personal work, they'll know that I love stripping stuff out. I love putting on black backgrounds. I love taking a barn or a truck or a motorcycle and making it so right there. Um, it's about the piece then. It's about the object. It's not about the background. Again, it's there's no historical value. There, it's just looking at something differently. And when I was when I first started in the commercial world, I mean, some of you probably know Richard Avedon. Avedon's portraits were black and white against a white background. Oh, and everybody said, "Oh, that's the easiest thing to do." I challenge you. I challenge anybody to do that and make them the way Avedon made them. You can't do it. Um, be it his film chemistry composition, you know, how he processed, how he printed, you know, I, I don't know. I have no clue. I couldn't make him work. So I love things taken out of where they are. And that's interior work. You know, I photograph a lot of interiors and the, granted, this is a beautiful old church. It got turned into a brewery and I just photographed this about a month ago. Um, and it's beautiful. I mean, I think a lot of people could walk in there. So when you walk into a situation like this, it's about finding the angle, finding the light, finding something that if you're standing there, you're probably not going to look at it the way the camera can or will or, you know, that we can express it. Um, and that's a beautiful space. So this whole space was nothing but light to me. That's all it was about is where are there cool shadows, where, where, where. Um, and to me, that's probably one of the best interiors I've taken in a long time. But again, it was a great interior. I photograph a lot in industrial areas, factories. This is actually up in northern Iowa. Um, it used to be the Winnebago plant, but now they make those big tires for um, like the fertilizer, like those three wheel fertilizer trucks and stuff. So as you're there and you're photographing for a client, you know, one of their big things and you got, you know, when I work for a client, you got to figure out what's important. Well, that cinder block wall was a huge deal for them because it was so tall. It had to be so thick. It had to be this. And I'm like, well, how the hell am I going to make a cinder wall look good? I don't know what to do. You know, so the longer you stand there, you're like, oh, look, you can see in there. Oh, look, there's a forklift. So it's kind of like watching, like being a bird photographer. I guess kind of sat there and watched this forklift for a while to get a, a feel of what he was doing. And, you know, the clients loved it. it. It showed the function of the door. It showed scale. It shows a lot. And to me, it's a very, I, I also love 2D images. I'm not big on angles, as people know. I like straight in. And so this was a great image for me to capture because it's probably one of my favorites. Same thing there, straight on. Um, you know, and, and again, people that, that know me, I, I say that a lot because some people here know me. I love to use corners. You know, it either has to be in a corner or it has to be completely centered. Um, and this was for, eh, it wasn't a farm bureau, but it was something along, the, it was a job, this was a job. And the little girl really wasn't even supposed to be in there. It was about raising chickens. And she just kept standing there. And I'm like, all right, here we go. So again, for me, I put her in the corner and it worked. It's a, it's a very strong image in my eyes. I had her on the left-hand side and it didn't flow. The chickens kind of circle around her and your eye goes right to her little pink at, you know, from the door. Uh, but that's one of those things where when you're when you're photographing and you've got clients there, you got to go fast. You know, I only you know you only have so much time. Um, so, yeah, I love that picture. Um, and that was a series when I was in St. Louis. I used it was a boxing club where kids went after school, um, and I just went and photographed the kids. And the only light I had was one light hanging from the ceiling. Um, right there. And, you know, and, and through 
these were originally printed in the dark room, but then I brought them into Photoshop and I darkened them down maybe a little bit more than, but the film was pretty close. The, the prints looked very similar. Um, and so again, you had to get in, had to get out. They had practice. They had to get home from school. You know, you don't have a lot of time. I photographed the national campaign for Pella window and door. Um, this was actually in Pella at the CEO's house. Um, this is one of the brochures that you would pick up at Lowe's Menards. Um, and that door is something special. I don't understand what it is. But the girls in the chairs were actually paid models. And they were just as stiff as stiff could be. Well, the girl standing in the doorway is the CEO's daughter. She came out there and just started raising holy hell. And so I just started snapping away. She's the cover. She was funny. She made the other girls laugh. So you've got to be spontaneous. you got to go with the flow. If I would have said, hey, get out of there, I would have never, ever have gotten that image. And so you have to let your pride go. You have to let go of, oh, yeah, I know what's best. No. And I, I will debate any photographer that says he's always in control. You're not in control. A photographer is not in control. You know, look at the wind, even in the studio. We're in we're in control, but not a hundred percent. So um same year I photographed the national campaign for Amana appliances. Um we set up a studio in Des Moines for a month. Um, and we knew I convinced them to find a space, an old storefront with north facing light. So it looked like that we were actually in kitchens and using window light. <coughs> um, and again, same thing. That was one of the client's dogs. The dog wasn't even supposed to be in that picture. It was supposed to be a guy stirring. And believe it or not, we photographed that job, those that the people was photographed and four by five film. So I had a pre focus. They had a, it just, that's the way we used to do it, especially if they wanted to go super duper big, you know, big store posters. Two and a quarter would have held, but they wanted four by five. You know, we shot like 8,000 sheets of film. It was crazy. Um, for six years, I photographed everything you saw for Von Mauer. It doesn't matter what it was. I built the studio at Von Mauer here in Davenport and photographed everything. I no longer do it, but I used to. You know, and the products that I went for, you know, from bottles, this is actually for PV guitar and amp, and this is the Eddie Van Halen Wolfgang line of guitars. I was down there for almost two months in Meridian, Mississippi, photographed, again, every piece of equipment and every piece of instrument they make. And so this was shot on film as well, all four by five. Um, so you had to control highlights. You have to control shadows. You can't get rid of it in Photoshop. Um, that They just wanted it on film. I, mean, we, I had all my digital stuff with me, but they wanted to shoot it all on 4 by 5 film. That's one of the covers. Well, awesome. Thank you. Now we are going to jump on. Now we are going to jump on. There you are. You are up, as they say. So hello, hello. We're and it's S S I E, not S E. Oh, see, yeah, I meant gonna... to. Yeah. <laughs> no one Happens said I could spell. <laughs> ah, well, uh, I, <sighs> if you pay any attention to my slideshows and you look very closely, there's probably things switched around all the time. So, <laughs> so we'll get started on you now. Okay. So your kind of story, where'd you start? How'd all that go? Uh, high school, actually. I um, thought I was heading towards art, uh, whether it was commercial art or painting, drawing, whatever. I got on the high school yearbook, picked up a camera, and um, that was it. I, I had my medium. I knew what I was going to do. And... Shortly after I picked up that camera, I was in a uh, classroom doing a, a uh, high school, a yearbook assignment, and I understood instantly 
everything about that camera. Up until that point, I'd been reading popular photography and trying to figure things out. And it was an epiphany. I, I looked at that camera and I instantly knew how to make it do anything I wanted. And, you know, I didn't go to college. I graduated high school telling people I was going to work at a newspaper. They all laughed at me. And a year later, after I graduated high school, I had my first newspaper job. And I never looked back. I did, uh, I've done it for 46 years now, uh, in and out of newspapers. I worked for a lot for magazines, um, uh, Time and Newsweek back in the day when they were good to work for. Um, lots of trade publications, airline magazines, everything. And then uh, probably my longest stint at a newspaper was at the Omaha World Herald, where I was there. I was there for 18 years. And the business was changing, um, more with less, more with less. Um, the the digital revolution, although I thought it would be, I thought, oh my gosh, these cameras will do anything. We'll have all sorts of space. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the way things went, it was it now. You know, it used to be, if you went to cover a big event, you'd cover the big event, you'd process your film and you'd give them your take. Well, now 10 minutes in, if you're working for a newspaper, you need to start sending pictures. And any, although the cameras do wonderful things, newspapers were not what they were. And four years ago, I decided to get out and I work for UNMC shooting pictures for them. And it's been an interesting transition because uh, in the commercial world, it, it seems like, uh, a lot of people forgot what real photographers can do because they just hand somebody a, an iPhone or they buy a really good digital camera thinking they'll get really good pictures. And uh, that's not the case. I got there and started showing them some of the stuff they could do. And it's like they, they can't believe you can you can do this and you do it so quickly and so easily. So, yeah, that's pretty much my story. I I. Graduated high school, jumped in the newspapers, uh, jumped in and out. I'd go commercial. I'd go uh, back to a newspaper. They'd suck me back in. And then, uh, yeah, I was a photo editor for a while in a newspaper. Hated that. Uh, it was good to nurture my shooters, but, man, playing the politics was was tough. But that that's me. Yeah. Awesome. So how, what's your definition of photography? For me, it's telling stories. Um, it was funny. In high school, there was a summer I bought my very first 35 millimeter camera thinking it would help me with my art. I could take pictures of things and draw it later, right? And uh, I, I, I grew up in a, I had an interesting childhood. We had a, a warehouse in a very bad part of town, but uh, uh, I had spent the night watching the warehouse. I was, pro I was in high school, probably my senior year. I go out on the railroad or out on the dock in the morning and there was a railroad switchyard near the, uh, near the warehouses. And I look out across the tracks and there's this weird silver train I hadn't seen before. I thought, well, it could have been Amtrak. No, it wasn't Amtrak. I'd never seen it. And then all of a sudden out of one of the boxcars, this snake like thing comes poking out of the door. I, I, I thought I was dreaming. So I grabbed the binoculars. I got to looking and it was a circus train. The Bringling brothers had parked on that siding beside the warehouse. And uh, I uh, ended up going over and hanging out with the, the, the circus people on the train. And I'm thinking, man, if there was a job or if I could just, I'm seeing some really neat stuff. If I could just share it with people. And it turns out it was. That was that was what got me into journalism. I could go see neat things and share it with people. So what is it to me? It's storytelling. Yeah. Making that, people that's laugh. Awesome. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's what I was going to do, too. I was going to get into photojournalism, and that was like 2005. And I found out real quick it probably wasn't going to work out. So I went elsewhere. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Unfortunately. We, I guess I don't think we know what we're missing out when we don't have people to photograph things for newspapers. It was a good job for many, many years. It was a, I, I got to see some amazing things, meet some, I mean, you've got the bad stuff too. And we'll, we'll probably get to yeah. that after a bit here, but uh, uh, what I shoot now for my own personal use, um, 
but man, for many years, it was, I had some great adventures, a lot of fun. So kind of, you know, besides that career, the passion thing, how does photography play a role in your life now? And kind of how has it influenced you? Uh, I have, I have been so lucky to see so many things, meet so many people. I've seen the best the world offers. I've seen the worst the world offers. And I've really learned to see better than most people. I, I can see beauty in the tiniest moment, you know, from, uh, and, and sometimes it was because I was you know, working for the paper and I was always the guy that, oh, this is a boring story saying, Kent, he'll figure it out because you get there and if you just give it time or you go for a walk, you see things. And uh, yeah, um, I've learned to see, uh, I've gotten a, a good understanding of people, both the good and the bad, so. That's awesome. So how do you find, how do you find your balance between that whole technical side and then the artistic vision that you have? Well, at, at this point, I've done it for so long um, that uh, technically I, 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 the decisions, the problem solving that's involved and in whatever you see a moment, it's like, what do I need to do to make, to bring out what I see happening you know, and, and I just automatically start switching things on a camera, you know, hit that F-stop, drag that shutter, whatever I need to do, pop a little strobe, just boom, boom, boom. So the technical side of things um, really takes a backseat. It's second nature. So it really frees me up just to play with the art, play with the light. I love that. So now your images. Yeah, that was a nice moment. So when oh, I, yeah, it's one of my favorites. Um, I was working at the World Herald and I was not having any fun. Um, and I'd gotten to a point, I'd seen so much tragedy over the years. Uh, at, at the paper, I was always, I, I, you cover a lot of tragedy, but I always made it a point to photograph the good things. And... Um, uh, probably the last big tragedy I had to, well, well, Fremont flood was the last big tragedy, but I had to go to a tornado town uh, a while before that. And I'd covered so many tornado towns. I, I'd reached a point where I just could not physically. I was just, I, I'd had, I'd seen too much. I've, I've done my share. I don't need to do anymore. It would make me angry. And um, so working at the paper, I thought, I realized that the reason I was staying at the paper uh, was it was my reason to go shoot pictures. So I decided to just start shooting for myself. And what I love shooting at the paper were these little features. You'd go cover the county fair. You'd go just any live event where you can people watch and, and catch a moment. So here I was. Uh, I went to the Sarpy County Fair, and uh, I'd walked all day. Uh, it, it had been a long day. I was dead tired. I was walking out to my car, and across the street from the fairs where all the cowboys parked their trailers, and the rodeo was over, and I'm walking through the lot, and the, the light is really dim. There's one, like, big uh, yard light, street light type of thing hanging uh, over the whole place. But I, I like I like playing with it. I like to, to walk that fine line. What can I, what can I pull off, you know? And uh, I saw this cowboy uh, walking around with the baby, right? And he was marching the baby around the, the parking lot, and I followed him for a while. And he comes back to his trailer, and he just happens to get in enough light that I could pull this off. And I, I walked up to him. I said, this is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. I have to take this picture. And he was cool with it. And uh, I'm looking at the light going, oh, I don't know. I, I had a 14-millimeter uh, on my Fuji. I think it was an XE3 or, or X-Pro2. I can't remember which. And I think I was at uh, maybe a fifteenth of a second at uh, two eight or f four. It was it was really dark. I was just kind of playing it by ear, and I fired quite a few frames and uh, gave him a card. I said I'll be happy to send you a, a, a picture if you like. I thanked him for doing it, and and you know he wasn't very talkative. He'd had a really rough day. The baby was crying. His wife was fed up with things. And he took the card. I never heard from him again. I have heard from people that know them, but uh, yeah, it was that was that was a real gift. That was, you know, sometimes I think I have to 
you know, put in the time to earn these pictures. Uh, mm -hmm. And this was the gift for a very long day. That is awesome. This one is so striking to me. I, it's, it says a lot. And it's, it's special to me too. This was shot on film back in the eighties. So mm -hmm. I can't remember if I was shooting an assignment. I mean, there's no metadata on film. So yeah. <laughs> uh, I think it was probably 83. I remember it was the, uh, uh, the Yaki Indian community um, in Guadalupe, Arizona, which is just, it's kind of a offshoot of Phoenix there. It's all the same. And uh, 4th of July parade. And, you know, this was pretty early on in my, I started in 77. So it was pretty early in my career. I, I had seen iconic moments happen in the dark room and the camera when i'd look at the film i'd say oh that's special uh but this was the first time i actually saw it coming together in real time it's like oh my oh my oh my and i'm firing away on film manually focusing i saw it in the dark room so and after it's, it's like once you crack that secret whatever it is and you can see it after that i started seeing those iconic moments more and more and it got easier so yeah, special picture. Yes, it is. Hmm. You know, <laughs> you're, you're, you're going to ask me what photography is, and sometimes it's, uh, it's, it's the act of capturing a moment, but sometimes it's uh, telling the story of a lifetime. So uh, I had, I love photographing, I'm making art out of art, right? So John uh, Leiba, the, the sculptor who made these, this is in the Durham Western Heritage Museum. And he's got these uh, lifelike sculptures spread throughout the museum. And I'd, I'd, I'd photographed something with most of them. Most of them are kind of funny, but this was a very solemn uh, piece where if you look at it closely, it, it's, it's a soldier going off to war. And a lot of people went to World War II through this train station. And I, I, I had, I'd been watching it for years. Like I'm going to find something that's worthy of that beautiful piece. And I can't remember what I was photographing. Something at uh, the Durham. And I looked up, and there was this couple, and it was the mirror image of the people on the bench. And to me, instantly, I thought, Oh, this tells the story. He survived the war, and they're living to a ripe old age. And I, I, I often go and talk to people after I take their picture like this. And, and I, I shot this. I was going to go talk to them, tell them I'd, I'd send them a copy. And I got distracted by something. I looked up and they were gone. So it, this one was neat. I, it, it, it's just a nice piece. It tells a nice story. Yeah. <laughs> I love this one. I don't yeah, think this, it's like you know, yeah, you know. Here's another. This is another. Okay, this was. I was. I had quit my first newspaper job. I had, you know, I was young. I, I didn't. I was raised blue collar, working in warehouses, and and the white collar uh, politics. Uh, I worked my tail off at my first newspaper. I worked way too hard, burned myself out, and they were more than happy to burn me out and use up my car and use up my cameras. I had quit. I had put the cameras in storage and I was uh, repairing furniture uh, at night. And uh, I used to go to a pool hall near my house, near my apartment. And I see this guy sleeping under the table. He, he, he teaches, teach, taught billiards during the day and he would uh, shoot at night. You know, some gambling was involved, but, uh, the owner of the pool hall would let him sleep under the table. And I, I, I couldn't help myself. I, it was that same old thing. This is so interesting. I have to share it with somebody. So I broke my cameras out of storage. I dusted them all off. I loaded up some film and, and it was fluorescent light in there. And the light under the table was terrible. And it wasn't like, you know, digital where you've got lots of latitude. I had to get it right. It was probably shot on Tri-X. Mm -hmm. So I had a little sun pack flash, little tiny one, and I rigged a, 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 another flash on the camera and I, and the sun pack, I put an optical slave on it and put it down low so I could light up under the table. And I shot this picture. It was, and I shot a bunch of other pictures. Uh, 
took it to the Arizona Republic newspaper, thinking I was just going to get a, a story out of it. And they looked at it and they gave me a job. So this was, <laughs> it, it sucked me back into newspapers once again. So I, I quit the furniture and went back to uh, taking pictures. That is awesome. I've always loved this one too. This is. So we did a series at the World Herald when we still had a good boss. Uh, it was called Nebraska 93, where we'd go to, we went to every county in the state, there's 93 counties, and found something interesting. And in this case, uh, I was driving out to a different county, but I was going out 275 and I got to Beamer. And I see this old couple out in the field walking beans. I thought, nobody walks beans anymore. I mean, I, I, I grew up in Phoenix, but we'd spend the occasional summer on Grandpa's farm and I got to walk beans. But uh, So I, I had time. I was just going out to find something interesting in another part of the state. So I pulled over. I walked out there. We started talking about the weather. And he told me his, he showed me those hoes that he's got there. He makes them out of, a, you know, old discs that he cuts up and, uh, his family had a welding operation too. So they had all the tools to do that. And, uh, it was about noon. The light was terrible. And I pulled a flash out of the bag and this was old enough that the digital cameras were not ready for prime time. So I needed to sweeten it up with a little bit of light. So I pulled a little flash out of the bag. I put a little warming gel on it and I, I pre-focused and I kept talking and I dropped the camera to my chest uh, so we can keep eye contact going. And we're, I'm thinking, this is gorgeous. What a sweet couple. And uh, he, uh, so she reached down and slapped her leg. She said, those flies are biting. And he said, that's because they like you. And that's when she... He smiled and gave her a hug and I fired a couple of frames and I had this moment. Well, it gets even better. Uh, I hear from the family, uh, they, they wrote me a nice letter. I sent them a print. Um, they wrote me a nice letter thanking me for the print and how happy they were to make the paper. And then when Edward died, uh, I got another nice note from him saying that uh, they loved this picture because it was the only picture they had of her mom of their mom when she was smiling. So, yeah, awesome. Uh, yeah, they're both yeah. they're both gone now. But uh, yeah, what a difference! Uh, I mean, I got a nice moment out of it. They 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 got some recognition for being the sweet people they are. So yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> and then I love that for you. <laughs> So, you know, when I, when I give photo talks, I, one of the things I talk about is playing the long game, right? So working at a newspaper, you often get the phone call when, when somebody hasn't done their job and come up with enough stories, they'll say, yeah, hey, we need some wild art, right? Uh, need a feature shot. And uh, you learn to take notes and keep special things in your pocket for uh, uh, when that happens. And for, I don't know how they do it everywhere else but in in nebraska come uh, well this was uh new year's time but uh, in the fourth of july time they put up big inflatable animals around their fireworks tents to draw everybody in and i had always you know it's like i i'd envisioned uh getting you know one of these gorillas looking like he's eating somebody and i thought oh wouldn't that be great if i could get it but you know you can't set it up your newspapers and it, w it would ruin the fun if you did you know i mean it, it, yeah. part of it is the hunt right yeah. so uh they opened up firework sales for new year's for the first time this year or that year and uh i was driving down there it was cold i wasn't real happy about shooting firework stuff in the snow and i get out of my car and my god this guy's blowing up this gorilla and, oh, the pieces are going to come together. This is, oh, oh, I barely got the camera, you know, up and ready fast enough and, uh, to get that picture. But it took me 10 years before this finally came together. So, yeah. <laughs> oh, I love that. That is awesome. So I think that's your last one I threw in here. Yes. So perfect. Well, thank you, Ken. My pleasure. Nice talking to you. Yes. It's all hey, on Jesse. you, Dennis. Oh, oh How no. are you? I'm fine. I'm <laughs> fine. Thank you. <laughs> Perfect. So, so uh, we'll uh, get Trent and Kent, 
thank you very much for the stories. I love the images. Um, I'm going to look up Avedon too. So that sounds interesting. So uh, yeah, I'm going to check that out. So thanks for sharing. Yes. Oh, oh so, um, yeah. I'm Dennis Perry. Uh, I'm out on the West Coast, California. Um, uh, 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 been shooting. Uh, I'm still a novice. I'm a novice to the other two guys. But uh, um, uh, iPhone 6 is where I started shooting. Uh, went to iPhone, I forget which one, but now I'm a Nikon shooter. I switched to Nikon and uh, uh, started taking classes and everything. So I have a full-time job. So the images I make are the images for me. And I can, just from the stories you guys were telling, it, 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 it sounds, uh, uh, I don't know, different, different from my story. So I'm still taking photos for myself. Uh, so once I uh, retire from work, I plan on uh, uh, doing more shooting and I just do my shooting in my spare time. There we are. So besides your career or passion, so how does this whole photography play a role in your life and how has it influenced you? So, like I said, I do this in my part time, uh, but uh, uh, I, I can I change the subject a little bit? You sure can. Uh, I'd like to start having discussions about AI photography. I am totally amazed and totally frightened at the same time. Um, I don't think photography will ever go away. Uh, so it's, there, it just won't ever go away. But it is just amazing what the AI photography is doing. I haven't done any. I don't plan on doing any. But uh, just just the things that they're they're doing is just amazing, and how they're telling stories and, and everything like that. So, uh, so yeah. So I don't know if I'm amazed or frightened uh, on that particular <laughs> thing. <laughs> um let's see um uh, uh so the role in my life um uh, uh yeah so i'm doing a couple of uh, i have a bunch of projects still lined up um uh, they're all for me um uh, i have neanderthals i'm working on i have a mag magazine uh write-up i'm doing um i'm just i just have all these projects that i'm working on right now so so it's fun and and doing it in my spare time I guess. So for you, you're very, I always said you, you got this different eye. Um, I was such a pleasure last year to look at your work through Paul's photo for the advanced class. And I'm always excited to see what you come up with and you're, you're so creative. So how are you balancing that technical thing and that artistic vision? And I've, I've always been on the creative side. And um, so so uh, uh, working the uh, knobs and gears on the camera to get your creative photo uh, or creativity flowing, it, it's always fun. Um, uh, once I learned manual uh, uh, mode, it just opened up the whole world to me. And um, just to get creative, I, I see things differently. And I like to share uh, the things I see with, with other people. Um, uh, it, I'm, I'm sad that the social media platforms are going more video now than photography. I would uh, like to see more photography um, um, sites open up maybe or something like that. Because I still like looking at photos more than I do videos and uh, uh, that, that type of thing. So, Yeah. And I, and I somehow left out the question on the slide. So how do you define photography? Uh, yeah, I like sharing what I, I see and um, I tweak it to uh, show people uh, even more uh, of, of the way I, I view, view my world. So um, photography, it, it's just so vast. There, there are so many aspects to it. Um, it. It's an event for me that I'm sharing with my, my, my friends and family. Awesome. Come on. There we are. So now I'll start looking at your work. So. Okay. Um, so, so, um, so I had this brilliant idea. I'm going to take New York style uh, uh, street scenes with the striking lights coming through and high rises and black and whites with uh, minimal uh, mid tones and everything. Uh, on the West Coast, that doesn't work. 
<laughs> so I had to develop a, a process to, to make my street photography um, uh, uh, West Coast style, I guess you'd call it, or how I see things. So um, uh, 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 I, I like people just doing the, the things that they're doing without me being distracting to them. And uh, so these are all different stuff. Obviously, uh, uh, definitely, I don't use Photoshop, but I do use uh, post-processing software. Um, uh, long exposures, I was started on these. Uh, I started playing with depth of fields and uh, 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 different things. So I usually present my stuff in uh, the similar format. So, uh, so I thought I'd share that with uh, you today, so. Yeah. I like uh, so, yeah, this one ended with the little man, uh, uh, but it began with the little girl in the pink tutu. I haven't worked out. I, I haven't uh, worked on. I have a whole series of her, but uh, uh, the little the little man uh, made the uh, photo pop for me. And um, uh, so. So uh, street scenes, uh, if you want people to ignore you, sit on the ground and uh, don't hold your camera up to your eye. So use your flip screen. Uh, people will ignore you or in this case, she's looking to see what I'm doing. And uh, it's always fun to see their reactions. Awesome. Well, perfect. So awesome. I will finish up here this evening. So first of all, I got to say thank you to Kent and Trent and Dennis, um, for them to so grace, gracefully say yes to this. Um, so I, I, what I'll do is I will go out to my Facebook page, my business one, and I'll uh, put all three of these wonderful guys on here and like their Instagram and stuff so you guys can go take a look at. I mean, I think uh, Kent said he had over like a thousand photos on Instagram. So, I mean, it's, I just love it. You, we barely brush the surface of all three of these guys' work. So... I would, again, thank you guys. They're super cool. Like I said, nobody wants to listen to me talk about photography for hours and hours on end. So it was great to see somebody else's, you know, views, how they view things and what it really means to them. So, so stay tuned. So this is what I got coming up. Um, so next week, I want to talk about, you know, making photographs versus taking photographs. That's right up Trent's alley. We've had discussions on that before. Um, and then the 27th and the 3rd, you get two weeks, so you don't have to listen to me. Um, I'll be in Colorado, so I'll be hitting Mesa Verde and Great Sand Dunes. So I was might be able to come back on the 3rd, but I don't want to rush it, so I don't know how I'll feel. So, oh, you're welcome, Pamela. And then um, let's see, the 10th of June, I'm just going to kind of talk about some things that pitfalls kind of holding people back as, as photographers in, in my sense that I think. Um, the 17th, I wanted to talk about a little bit about creating a photographic workflow. Um, you know, what I think uh, Kent spoke on a little bit about that and that kind of that process, but I'll kind of go through mine. And then the 24th, why can I not read that? Oh yeah, looking at subjects in a different light. Um, you know, looking at the same thing, I get caught up a lot and I've seen the same thing over and over and over. So what do I do? How can you look at something you see all the time and photograph it differently? And then July 1st, we'll talk about creating like a post-process workflow. And I'll go through mine. Everybody always asks, how do you edit your photos? I kind of talked about it a little bit this morning um, with the gal at uh, Coffee and Clicks, you know, kind of how I look at a photo and what am I going to do here? Oh, you are welcome, Peggy. Thank you. Um, and then we will talk on July 8th about elements of the photograph. You know, um, I don't quite know where that's going yet, but it sounded good. So, you know. I've got a whole process that we can, I guess, talk about that. So as always, that's what's coming up. And as always, the giant thank you, because I wouldn't come back here if it wasn't for you guys. So as long as you guys show up, I show up every Saturday. And if you ever got questions, you know where to find me, things you want. So again, thank you to Trent and Dennis and Kent for coming on. It was great to see three different perspectives and how photography's influenced them. And I love stories. Everybody knows I'm a talker. Uh, so I love to talk. You throw photography into it, I'll talk even more. But 
I love stories and it was great to hear Trent and Dennis's and everybody's stories, you know, behind the images because we all view a photograph, right? But we don't always know the story behind it or we can assume a story. So um, I know the one I had heard Kent's story about the couple, you know, in the bean field. And when that was one that I could choose from the throw up there, I had to. So again, thank you guys. It was super awesome. Uh, you know, as always, you can share the show, find out people. If you want to support the show, you can scan the little barcode thingy up at the top. That's all I got to say about that. Um, so again, thank you guys, Peggy, Paul, all you guys that always show up every week. So we are done and I will see you next week. So you guys have a good rest of your week. And thank